Thank you for to Fabrica for inviting me onto this residency. Um, yeah, this is really a kind of um, a continuation and an, uh, an, uh, a project that grew out of work I started um, in Calais about three years ago. And I'm going to show you a little bit of um, previous project work that has kind of led on to this and that has really kind of informed my interest that first brought me to Calais and which has then led on to this theme really. The, the tunnel itself, yeah, it has its 20th anniversary and, and it's kind of um, doing two things at the same time on, on different kind of levels. It's connecting two countries and at the same time it kind of represents a border between them or the way the border is organized today. And in terms of um, the creation of a monument, or it does also two opposite, very <coughs> opposite things, and which is kind of a paradox. It, well, naturally, the tunnel is invisible itself, but it, it, it produces kind of visible, visibility for a number of, of, of events and things that are apparently not related and allows, in this, in this project, it came to be used as a kind of optical tool almost that allowed to, to, to enter different narratives. And I found myself for the first time working with um, found photographs, which has kind of changed my, my own practice, practice and also has informed my own image making in, 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 the, in the wake of that. So it's very much ongoing work, and it's and, and rather than rather than I'm, I'm I'm kind of lost interest in it. It seems impossible to and, and not really necessary to to um, bring it to a point of conclusion. Really, it's more about an ongoing uh, production, knowledge production, and it's been become a very communicative experience as, as well as it has brought together people who participated participated in contributing photographs which I were going to be showing you in a minute. So, um, yeah, it's great to be back in Brighton. I lived here for three years doing my BA until 2003, and um, my own practice is kind of informed by an interest in, in, in architecture, landscape, spatial practices, and... Um, Following on from the years in Brighton, I, I, I relocated to, to Seoul and South Korea for, for, for quite a f for three years and got very really interested in urban redevelopment, which is going on at a pretty intense scale. And this series, um, the rooftop series, became a way to kind of read across Korean history. And it kind of was a way to, to, to get an insight into, into a private space that is otherwise concluded. So these rooftops are offer a belated insight into, into, into private sphere, but also are a way to show, to, 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 to tell the history of, of Korea since, since the civil war in the 50s and, and the common economic um, growth they had uh, in the following years from that. And, and what's happening is basically that Seoul is being redeveloped at, at, in, on a massive, massive scale, so like these kind of high rises replace these rather fragmented um, neighborhoods from the 70s or 1980s. And it's um, also interesting from a different point perspective because the rooftops are pretty important in, in social movements and protests. And, and whenever, there's, um, whenever there's a clash between, say, organized unions or people who kind of try to resist um, property development, um, most of these confrontations between protesters and the local population happen on the roof. So these rooftops had a kind of um, almost metaphorical meaning. And I was really interested in the diversity of, of, of and the materiality of, of, of these areas that were just about to disappear completely. And they're kind of open spaces, open to... Um, all kinds of interpretations, and then the, really the, the, the materiality of, of metal, wood, plastic, is, is a way to, to read the history of, of Korean society. Same with these. These, were, um, these are sites 
allotments really, kind of allotments, gardens in the wider Seoul area, um, partly used for private use, growing vegetables, growing um, to, 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 to meet one's, one's own ends. But also they are a way to, 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 to trace these kind of um, things that kind of find their way back into, into, into these semi-abandoned sites. So it's, it's, they're almost like little sculptures and I found them quite beautiful in their own right. And this project kind of almost led on to, to this is kind of what brought me to Calais, really interested in, 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 a, in a kind of particular spatial practice that is a way to articulate oneself also politically this is more like, an, in, in, this, in this case, it's more like an interpretation, a means of interpretation, but in, 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 in the Korean context, these are really important and, and because oftentimes these sites are sites of confrontation between people who can afford on to, to a different kind of lifestyle. And what, we, what brought me to Kale later on was pretty much an interest in what is happening, or what has been happening since the tunnel opened and 20 years ago, it has become a place that's almost on the forefront of the European border, and this has been in the media for migrants, who, who refugees, who've since been trying to, to cross into the UK, and it's almost um, relocated, put Calais into a very different kind of geographical context. When I started working, there I had very much in mind to, 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 to find, to, to seek these kind of sites. And it turned out that it was rather difficult to do so. It turned out to be rather, for, for, for obvious reasons, um, my migrants hadn't really, there wasn't really an interest in, 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 in cameras. There was a strong resistance and, and also it had been kind of over photographed. There had been, I came across a couple of books and projects that were pretty much what I had in mind. So what I did instead was rather looking for, um, for, looking for existing, existent work. So this, this image became my, my starting point and was my, my first, um, my first, um, encounter with, with one of the local archives. This is a f French uh, photographer who works for Agence France Presse, who photographed um, the eviction of the, what the, has been dubbed in the media as the jungles and, um, and the, in the early, in the late, two, in the, around 2009. And the photograph really is kind of is talking about what the situation in Cali on the ground is, is, is about. Or has been about for for a long time. It was um, the jungles, kind of are right next to the port, to the docks of Calais, sort of in a semi semi abandoned industrial area, and um, became the target of a really uh, similar campaign to the one that's that's being repeated now. And the picture to talks to me about what's happening in front of the cameras, which is, which is really kind of a mise-en-scene, um, a political event created for the presence of the media, and it's a really confrontation between different participants in, in, in this event. So you have the police, activists, media, and almost as um, least importantly, um, the, the migrants, who kind of really, it's, it's kind of a battleground for, for the creation of an image of this. And from that point onwards, I started looking for, 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 for other work, and I was really interested in what the history, what, what kind of led to this event at the time. And um, which has now brought me back to, um, to the idea of the monument. At the time, the first project I was working on in Calais is called the registration machine. And it's, in a way, it's bringing together events that are not related on a, ton of, uh, on a kind of timeline. So they are going back in, in time. The first event that was really important was Rodin working in Calais on a commission at the end of the 19th century um, 
on the six on the burghers of Calais. And for Rodin himself, it was he was very much aware of how important photography was and how much he was involved in, 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 in generating a means of representation. And for the city of Calais at the time, it was a way to spend money that came out of um, the history of industrialization. So, um, and over a period of 10 years, Rodin was working on the completion of this commission, which then resulted in this opening ceremony. But which, what is really not visible in the picture is how conflicted the, the process of, of the creative process was and also the commissioning process. There were money problems. There, were, there was no sense of agreement on how the sculpture should look like. So Rodin had very much his own mind, whereas the commissioning party had a pretty different idea. And the, also there was no agreement on, on where the sculpture ideally should be. And it, it's been relocated a couple of times within the urban space of Calais. It was, and has then become an image in its own rights. It's kind of been an image that has entered the Internet has entered the, the market uh, as, as a kind of postcard, as a, as a reproduction, as an, as an idea of itself. And there, there are, now there are ten copies of the sculptures distributed all over the world. It's, like it's, it's a very important part of the collection of the museum, of the permanent display of the museum. There were photographers like Candida Hofer had been um, commissioned to photograph the sculptures in different sites all over the world. And, and, and this, this, this postcard is a reproduction um, the museum did, and it has this reference. The color bar is a, has this reference for archive for the purpose of archiving. And the site itself is now um, we're going to see the site later in, 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 in a later picture because it has more or less disappeared after the war. And the sculpture now is part of a sort of a public garden in front of the town hall. Another photographic event and that that kind of notion is, is, is really important was the flight between the first flight across the channel between England and France which was a competition sponsored by the Daily, by the Daily Mail at the time and um, there were basically two main protagonists, Louis Blériot and um, Hubert Lautin Blériot won and um, he also was very much aware of how to how to use how to make use of this event, and it was this is something that coincided with the emergence of the picture press. It was in the history of photography. It's a very important event, and um, again, this is part of the collection or of the archive depository of the museum. Interestingly, it's a um, nearly black, completely black, four by five inch negative. And whoever found it wasn't really sure if it really shows. So it's blurry your question mark. In the 1950s, um, there was a big exhibition, or quite an important exhibition at the museum, um, remembering the 50th anniversary which hosted a lot of models and, and brought together also a lot of prints that now sit in different archives across France, from archives affiliated to museums, uh, the Musée, Musée de l'Aviation, um, archives affiliated to belonging to, to certain media institutions that are still around. And it kind of um, left many traces. And what is important in, in this is kind of I, I kind of established keywords by the time to structure this work in a, in a way. So this is the models are important in, in the production of the idea of the tunnel. Models are important in, in, in Rodin's work. Models were important also for those who got really excited about the flying. So this is a local uh, riverain, a local uh, person living in living in. Blériot Plage, who now collects lots of 
random items, postcards, cups, ashtrays, everything to do with the, with the, with the flight. And the place itself, it is, it's part of Calais, but it's named after Blériot, and it's something that, which also kind of shows how important these events were. Like, the local mayor renamed the town as soon as Blériot died, because he had really no interest in, 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 in this kind of, um, in, in giving his name to this, to this local, local place. And interestingly, he was called Bar Les Barracks, the barracks before, because it was a place where the army was based for a long time and where Calais sent its victims of the plague at the time to, to die, basically. And um, models became then important in the post war area. This is another archive which is based in Paris and contains a collection of photographs that were commissioned in the post war years after the Second World War to document the reconstruction mainly of the northern French cities and towns. And um, there were four photographers working full time over quite a long time. There was a Ministry of Reconstruction at the time, which is now, which exists, existed for 10, 15 years, I think. And the, but the collection is quite, quite um, um, impressive. Cali got completely destroyed in, in towards the end of the war, in the last weeks of the war, and was completely rebuilt. And it's almost as if architecture, because it's, 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 it's a completely new town built in the 1950s and 60s. It's almost as if, if, as if architecture is creating a, a monument in itself. And interestingly, these photographers who worked for the commission took with them the first kind of ectochrome color, color slide films and shot them on the side. So this is kind of a, a side effect. The archive, the commission was really mainly looking at public, public places that involve public and public, the public hand, money for this is sort of surrounding what is now the, the big marketplace. And the tower of, of, of the postcard with the sculpture in front of it is sort of integrated into this ensemble of, of buildings. So it's kind of what's interesting, what was fascinating for me was really this ongoing process, process of spatial practices that kind of find its way into, into, into the photographs. This is Kali in the background, this is where now sits the tunnel um, terminals. It's part of the it's part of the landscape that kept that was kept being turned upside down during the years of the construction. And the photographer is again a local um, inhabitant of, of Coquel, which is right next to where the Eurostar where you take the train from, um, who was really quite passionate about was this huge kind of project that was happening on his doorstep so he photographed a lot of the landscapes and he managed also to sneak into the tunnel he, he made himself a badge and um, managed to take his own photographs down there and is now has now five like a massive collection of images from the time what's interesting here is really the kind of this technology on a scale that's beyond comprehension, and, and even even in, in, in if, if if you look at um, their photographs, that kind of document the, the steps in in the construction process, and they're beyond comprehension and become kind of an artwork in their own rights, and talk about things that are not immediately there. It was also interesting in terms of the twenty years of the tunnel is that. Amidst all the other anniversaries, the World War, the landing in Normandy, and, and, and whatever there is at the moment, it is really met with a lot of quiet, almost like, I mean, there was there wasn't there was a really sort of discreet ceremony in May. I think the opening day was in in May, but it reflects kind of the attitude how the tunnel is really disconnected, and I don't know. If, assume if, maybe few of you have been to Calais, but you kind of really make this experience 
of an almost Balladian kind of landscape. You can take them, you can get off the boat or off the tunnel and without getting to see anything of, of Calais proper. So you can have this motorway going around connecting the port with connecting the port with um, one of Europe's biggest shopping malls and it also reflects the kind of the sense of disappointment. I think Calais, people in Calais felt after after a while because I think that it was it came with promises that couldn't couldn't be kept and, and also it reflects it's it's very much a child of the Thatcher years. It's kind of the first project on this scale that a for public transport without any public involvement. So it's, it's a huge conglomeration of, of big corporations that put money in there. It went rather bad for the first years financially, but it kind of brought its own mini micro -proce process of industrialization. So there were six to nine years of high peak employment. There were thousands of workers on both sides of the channel. I think in, 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 in Cali, 5,000 uh, 5, in Kent, there were quite a few as well. And it all crumbled away afterwards. So, so people relocated afterwards and, and it kind of reflects Cali's own history of, of industrial growth, which brought Rodin to Cali, for instance, but which has all but disappeared But now. It's just like, in many, like as many Cali was big in lace industry, so um, which is all but is all but gone now. There's like three, there's maybe maybe three play, three sides left that still produce. So it's very really struck with unemployment. And um, what's interesting, yeah, I mean, like in in in, in, in the mining tours or the towns in the north or whatever, I've been. One of the archives I visited is in Liverpool, and I mean th this process of, of of turning industrial past into heritage, like in here, for instance, the machines became automatically. They now sit on the roundabouts near the tunnel terminal, and um, sort of um, this is part of the family of the guy who made himself a badge, Monsieur Lecras, who was just based around from 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 there. So what the tunnel then brought um, after a while is um, <coughs> it became this gateway or this, this what appeared to be a gateway and became massively attractive to, to illegal migrants and refugees. It's, at the moment it's really kind of going back to a new all times high. I think it was it has quieted down. I think at the moment there are up to 2,000 people living literally on the streets of Calais. So the, the tunnel kind of represents also a new kind of border border regime, which brought me to. I haven't these. I haven't gotten. Unfortunately, I haven't got these in a, in, 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 a, in a bigger in a bigger size. This is part of a collection of photographs of a museum in Liverpool, which is the Customs Museum. That looks really at the history and the role of the. Um, UK, what's now called the UK Border Force. I think they changed name and they changed also with the changing politics surrounding surrounding Schengen and, and all the rest of it. So they changed role, but it's, it's, interestingly, they they kind of produce a new show at the moment and a new display that really reflects in the role of the of the border force, and which is also something that's really brilliant for me that's coming out of this process of of the residency because it's going to be going to have a future in terms of um, I'm going to continue working with them so the bottom picture for instance is a barrier that is kind of used to prevent the entry to entry of animals into the tunnel apparently they can't really control that fully but it's so there's all kinds of different machines and um, technologies in play to control this passageway and in the, in the very first place it, 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 it needed a kind of political framework to, to make this whole thing happen at all so what it, what it, has, what it has allowed to do me uh, to do is basically 
bringing together different narratives and, and, and moments from the history of the tunnel, from, the his, from different kind of narratives that, not, that didn't really coincide. So this, for instance, is the construction of a facility that was used during the tunnel construction as a pre-assembly factory. So tunnel parts were coated in there and then brought into, into the, lowered into the tunnel shaft. And this building itself became one of the biggest temporary industrial facilities in this part of, of, of Europe. And it became later the home of the Red Cross shelter when the, arrival, the number of arrivals of, of migrants in Calais was so big that the Red Cross decided to open a facility to accommodate them, which is also something that found its way to the collections of, of, of some of the French institutions that um, were part of the Voices of the Sea exhibition. One contribution to that show was a body of work that was photographed in the late 90s that showed the... Basically, it was a huge factory and the Red Cross set up a a camp made out of tents and containers that was sitting in that factory. And as with the first image, this building was later then destroyed in a heavy, heavily mediatized campaign as well. Just to create another image, like, like as, it's, as it is happening today, it's, it's really about creating a kind of visual regime that allows to, to, to implement a kind of policy resulting from that. So the, the message of this was supposed to be that there is no, there will be no accommodation in Cali, which hasn't really helped a whole lot. So um, basically, yeah, so we're basically literally the, the spatial practice around this event kind of changed. And um, so this is a member of the UNHCR, which has a permanent facilities in, in Cali, look, looking onto the side of the jungle, which was probably six years, six years later. And this is the site before, before, before evacuation and uh, photographed by, by a photographer who owns an area company and he took over a company that actually was really much involved in, in, in documenting the, the tunnel works. So there's these sort of overlapping biographies and histories of, of photographs. So this, this, this photograph is owned by the same person. And this is also one of my, sort of one of, for me, for, to me it's almost one of the key images because it kind of shows a lot and it shows nothing at the same time. It's um, the ultimate kind of conceal, mode of concealment, if, if you want to, for the tunnel. And, it's at, and it's at the same time, it, it, it's about the tunnel itself. And, um, yeah, the question around the, the modes of production that are behind the production of, 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 of the, the producing of, of, of collective memory that are oftentimes in behind memorials and forms of commemoration, mainly about, like, in many, many cases surrounding the world, the world war that's been commemorated this year. And this was a way to, to, to accommodate different kind of narratives and to get people on board that also have found their own ways of, 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 of constructing narratives and, and contributing to, to a kind of collective memory. <coughs> so the, fo the format for this has been, for the last few months, has been a block. I've been almost gotten to the, it's almost to me it's always been gotten to the point where, where I'm kind of creating my own archive and it I made a lot of finds over the, over the, over the few, or last few years. I, st I started working in Calais during my MA. And then just kept visiting on a regular basis. And part of the contribution to the show, Voices of the Sea, last year 
of the two months residency that are kind of allowed to, to further explore and to, to make new contacts and also to develop my own kind of photographic response to this. And it turned out that this kind of, uh, but initially I was really interested in, 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 in sort of staying local on the ground and just really working with archives and images that are held in, in Cali proper. And later with, um, in the course of this residency, we became, it became more interesting to, 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 to look at a wider picture also. And um, Innocent Passages ref refers to, it's a, it's a term from um, international law of passageways on the sea. It grants the right of passage to any vessel that means no harm to a um, sovereign or territorial entity. And it kind of reflects the passages and non-passages of images. Of course, what's been quite important is the fact that None of these images have been in use for a while. It's been really forgotten photographs almost, like they were part of private collections, part of public collections of, that belong to the museum to... Especially Eurotunnel, that was the biggest surprise, probably had no interest at all in, um, in, in, in maintaining an archive. There's a lot of okay. There's a lot of pro image production that comes with the tunnel. There's books you can buy on how the tunnel was built, but they're kind of repetitive. But what the tunnel did, in a way, it, it kind of set up a temporary um, social life that was connected with that. So there was a real kind of working community of workers living living in Calais, being, and it was very alive. There were a lot of events, a lot of, uh, it brought a lot of people visiting the tunnel. So there were all these official events of Mitterrand coming to, to Calais. But it is all but, it all but disappeared. And, and these photographs were a way to kind of look back into that. And it became also a way to talk about the history of, about migration, what's happening, um, what's happening in, what's happening in, on the borders of, of Europe and how this kind of whole idea of the border has been turned upside down. So the research for this project really kind of turned around a number of keywords that became very important and which also allowed to reframe the work. So it's almost become a kind of curatorial practice to, to work with these, to, to work with this material and to, to, to seek different kinds of ways to, 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 to tell different stories.